solid. That's good. Here we go, Ray. So I'm going to put it on record. And then what's going to happen, Mr. Ray Longwood, is you're going to hear some, you're going to, we're going to have the intro, then I'm going to introduce you and we're just going to talk. Okay. Got it. Cool. Do, do, do. Hey, 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 guys, it is Allison from Allison Answers. Cannot wait for you to hear what we got today. Hey, hey, hey guys, it is Allison from Allison Answers. Welcome to our show. Today we have a really, really good, good show for you. It sounds like, what was that guy? This is a really, really, really good show. Who was that guy? Well, anyhow, back to, I just want to remind everybody what our mission is. We are Mission Awake. And the reason that we are here, I want to remind you guys, we are here because we want to make a difference. We want to make a difference. We want to add value wherever we go. So that is my main mission in life. And remember the primary reason we are here is to remember that we are made for more than this, that we are made to be creators and not reactors. We are made to be um, people who create beautiful and good things that we were designed to create. So most of us, what we're doing is we are following an automated system and that automated system comes from the world that we were born into. And whatever world we've been born into, um, that is the world that we follow and the belief systems that we follow and that affects our thinking, our feelings and our choices. And when we make choices based on a faulty belief system that comes from possibly trauma or um, just distorted, perception of anything that we learned at a very young age, what ends up happening, it becomes super hardwired in us and we don't even know we're doing it. So my main goal in life is I want to wake up the freaking world. Like, wake up! What is going on? Let's see if what we got here to do there. Here we go. Like, wake the freak up. Okay. So basically, I, I'm, I say it to myself too. I want to wake up. Because every day, like, I can find myself just slowly slipping into old crap that I think, you know, your default mechanisms. And what I was sharing with you guys, you know, at all different times, that during the pandemic and during now all this social unrest, a lot of what's happening for all of us is that we are going back to default mechanisms. People are relapsing. People are yelling at their wives or their husbands or their kids or they're, or they're falling into depression or they're compulsively overeating or they're or they feel anxious, or they, or, 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 or they go back to an old way because that's what our bodies do. And that kind of what we do here, our mission is to wake ourselves up. The only path to freedom is truth. So our whole goal here is just to tell the truth, be honest. We'll curse. I don't care about cursing. We will tell the truth. It doesn't matter to me as long as everything is led with love and honesty and truth and helping people to get to be the people that they were created to be. So if I can just one person, I don't care if it's a teenager cutting themselves in their basement this morning and they have nobody to talk to, if you hear me out there, then, then, then I done my job today. So basically I'm gonna to introduce to you um, one of the best people I know, one of the people who's made an incredible impact on my life throughout my life, for a long time, not throughout my life, I'm much older than him, so that sounds stupid. But anyhow, um, that wasn't true. That didn't bring me to freedom. Okay, so now <laughs> back to the story. What the hell was I talking about? See, I don't have Ryan here to keep me on track because this is this this is going to be a shit show today, guys. Without Ryan, but I got I have Ray, so we're good. Okay, so. Who I have here today is Ray Longwood. Ray Longwood is the pastor of the Experience Vineyard Church in um, Limbrook, New York. I, Limbrook, Rockville Center, New York. 
I've only been going there since 1988. Rockwell Center is where that, that church is. Um, but anyhow, so Ray is a father of four beautiful, amazing children, and really a wife that I'm personal friends with, that I just, she is the, the real deal, just an amazing person, an amazing friend. And Ray um, is somebody who's super smart, uh, but he's uh, not only like emotionally intelligent, he's spiritually intelligent, he's, he's uh, balanced, he's not extreme or dramatic, but he is intense and fun, but he knows, he doesn't, um, he doesn't run with the extreme. So uh, I have Ray on today. As some of you guys aren't going to be uh, watching us. We're also on YouTube, so you, you can see us physically, but Ray is a Black American. And, uh, you know, I don't, um, you know, I don't say African American just because I don't. And um, I sure Ray doesn't care. But anyhow, um, the reason that Ray is here is I asked him to come and just talk about his heart and about um, what it's been like to grow up as a black man in America. And, you know, just to share who he is and anything that he would want you guys to know about kind of how to cope. And really my job here as a therapist is to help you guys to find a way to cope with the, the unrest and just to know how to manage it. I know for me, and Ray, I'm going to have you talk in just a second, just for me as a white person, I'm like apprehensive and nervous because I really don't know how to communicate thoughts or feelings because I really get it. I really get every single person's perspective. Like every time I hear a different person talk, I understand where they're coming from. And that's what's weird. Like being a therapist, you can hear the heart. You can hear like what the behavior to me is very secondary. I mean, now I can, t let me tell you something right now, because I can hear the ch chatter. Oh, behavior doesn't matter. No, do not judge me. Okay. I didn't mean behavior doesn't matter. What I mean is, is that behavior is secondary to the heart. Because when you real, when I sit with people, you know, every day and I hear the different things that people do and the different things that every one of us do, including me, including Ray, including everyone, we all can suck sometimes, but the heart of man is what we really want to know. So I believe, and I'm not going to speak for Ray, but I know my heart is always for unity and it's always for love because love is the greatest force on earth that love can take down anything. So I believe in those two things. So now I'm going to let Ray speak. Ray, can you just like, just tell us about you? Because that I want people to know you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, Allison, thank you for having me on this. I really appreciate the invite. And I just want to say how proud I am of you and excited for you as you've just, uh, just exploded in terms of the vision that God has given for you in your life and how you've been able to impact hundreds upon thousands of people. Um, because as you impact individuals, they are able to impact others with the story of healing uh, that you're able to walk into. So I just want to say I appreciate you um, and God is pleased with the work that you're doing. So Thank I just want to put that out there. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ray Longwood. What up? I'm here. Uh, so as Allison has mentioned, I am a Black American, African American, however you want to describe me, absolutely. But first and foremost, I am a child of the living God. I'm a king's kid, so that comes first beyond anything for me. Uh, but uh, just to give you an idea of, of what I experienced, as a black man in uh, America. I think for me, it's just, just let me just put it out there first. This is my context. I'm not speaking on behalf of all of black America. Um, every black American has had a different experience based upon where they grew up, when they grew up, how they grew up. There's a ton of different experiences uh, that African Americans or black Americans have had in America, but I'm just sharing mine. Uh, but for me, uh, I was raised in a Christian home, brought up uh, in church. Church was fundamental to my development spiritually uh, and how I respond to other people. So 
uh, as I grew up uh, throughout my years as an adolescent, I was always in church, always in a church that was diverse, um, pretty diverse. Uh, and so that has kind of been my experience, always around people of different ethnicities, different cultures, uh, not seeing one above the other. That's kind of been my, my expression. Um, but I do have to say, uh, with that, with that context, that for me growing up, things were different. Um, my parents, I grew up, I was born in Yonkers, New York. My dad worked for DuPont, uh, got a job uh, with DuPont, relocated to Newark, Delaware. Um, and in doing so, uh, I think that's kind of where things began to adjust for me, my framework, um, my perspective on myself, life, uh, how things begin to kind of uh, change for me. Um, how old so we, how I was old? about, I was eight, oh, okay. eight going on nine. That's a very um, significant so, age, by the way, everybody. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. Up until, the, mm -hmm. up until that point, things were kind of easy going, you know, yeah. I kind of, you know, things were, weren't tense. Um, but then, you know, we moved from a pretty diverse neighborhood, even in Yonkers, to a pretty much all white neighborhood in Newark, Delaware. Um, and so things began to adjust for me during that stage uh, in my life. And I didn't have difficulty making friends because like, as I said before, I grew up with diversity, grew up around different uh, ethnicities, white people, it didn't matter. So, um, you know, I think for me, there wasn't a sense of, of difficulty making friends. I think one of the things that I experienced uh, uh, at the beginning of, of, within that first year of moving to Newark, Delaware, is something that uh, is called double consciousness. Uh, that is when someone becomes aware uh, that um, based upon how they look or based upon the skin that they're in, uh, for people who are African American or Black American, it's the level of awareness to say, hey, my skin is darker. And because of that, uh, that means something different for me that I potentially may not be looked at as being equal to people whose skin tone is lighter than me. Um, that in fact, that to some people whose skin tone is lighter than me, that I am seen as evil. I am seen as a threat. I am seen as less than. Um, and so that's kind of when the awareness for me began sort of around that, that time. Uh, at a young age where I, because I, I grew up respectful, my parents praised me well, I was allowed to go over to people's house, friends' house who were white, spend the night at friends' house who were white, but they weren't necessarily allowed to spend the night at mine. Um, and not quite putting two and two together, you know, at that age and stage, it's just like, oh, uh, whatever, okay, you know, but, but over time you kind of, kind of see that and you recognize that like, well, wait, what's different about, about me? Like, why? What are you afraid of? That sort of thing. And then after, you know, the parents get to know my parent, you know, and things kind of change a little bit, but initially that's kind of what happened with me. Um, and then there were a lot, a lot of um, microaggressions that, that happened uh, as, at a young age where I was never called like a racist name per se, but, um, uh, there were often times where nicknames uh, in, in your crew would come up and I always had a, a, a nickname that referenced my skin tone or whatever mm -hmm. like that. And, and these are certain things that I kind of like just tucked away um, because they, they hurt. But the goal for me at that stage in my life was to be accepted. So you take whatever you take just so that you can be accepted, right? Like, so what if that hurts? Doesn't matter, put it away, you wanna be accepted. Um, but the truth of the matter is, oftentimes acceptance doesn't mean equality. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and that kind of was like a lot of what I experienced growing up. Like I said, nothing harsh, no run-ins with the police, none of that, but there was a lot of microaggressions that built up over time for me. Uh, I think one of the big things that hit me was around seventh grade, um, where uh, I went to a, a Christian school. My parents wanted me to have a Christian education, a well, a good education. Um, and at that point in Delaware, if you wanted to go to a private school, most of them were predominantly white. Yet again, 
I was comfortable with that. None of that, you know, affected me, affected me negatively. Um, didn't have a problem making friends. But here's what happened. Here's where things started to kind of shift for me. Um, seventh grade, my main sports were uh, football and soccer. Um, you know, uh, and it's funny, right? Like oftentimes part of those microaggressions that I experienced growing up, up until that point, and even after that point in seventh grade, that there was always this general assumption that basketball was my sport, um, or I was really good at basketball. I remember meeting uh, even friends' parents and like, oh man, you know, like what position do you like to play? I'm like, what do, what do you mean? And I'm like, linebacker. I'm, I'm talking about like, <laughs> A football, you know, they're like, no, 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 like basketball, you point guard, you, I'm like, dude, I don't even like it like that, like, <laughs> why are you assuming, and so one of those things that you just get used to, it's like, all right, here I go, I'm in this room of people, I'm assuming that they're all going to think that I like this, I like this, I like that, I like basketball, blah, 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 so when that kind of hit home for me was uh, in seventh grade, um, I wasn't playing on the school basketball team, but the, one of the best players who was playing this was at the beginning of the season got injured. And I remember the coach uh, coming to me and saying, dude, like, we want you to play basketball. We got a game coming up this week. We'd love to have you out there. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to never see you play, pick up a ball, ever, really. Um, so he's like super excited about it. The team is getting like super excited about it. And I'm just like, all right, like I'm a star. You know what I mean? Pressure, that's freaking totally. pressure. I'm like, I don't know what they expect, but I like the attention right here and now. And uh, the coach even went as far as to call my parents and like, hey, we'd love to have your son play the game. And my parents were like, whatever. I know you're not like a big fan of basketball, but like it's up, they left it up to me. So I'm like, yeah, I'd, let's do this. And then we go to McDonald's <laughs> afterwards. You guys go to McDonald's after the game? Like, <laughs> let's do this. Uh, so I remember going to the game. Uh, coach puts me in there. And there was just this excitement from the bench. I was like, cheering me on. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you a little bit of a framework. I've never played organized basketball. <laughs> I've only played with my white friends oh, in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Yeah, yeah. They were all bad at it. So, <laughs> so, so I, it was not, you know, it wasn't in my wheelhouse. Uh, football, <laughs> soccer, I got you. Basketball, not so much. Um, and so I get out there and literally uh, it, was, it was awful. <laughs> I, I fouled out so quick. It had to be one of the most quickest fouling outs that ever happened. Uh, it was like five minutes I was out there and the whistle blew like every time. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I don't, this is how I used to play. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? And uh, get fouled out. And I remember just walking to the bench, like feeling down about mm -hmm. myself because this happened. But then seeing the coach's face and then seeing the rest of the teammates, like, dang, dude. It was, they didn't say it. Thank God they didn't, because I don't even know how I react. Yeah. But you could tell, dude, you're black. Like, oh God. You're yeah. supposed to like. You're the you were the great black hope for our team, mm. uh, <laughs> and you're such a letdown. You know what I mean? And it was like, it was weird for me because I felt like not only did I fail the team, but a part of me almost feel like felt like I failed as a black person. Wow. Like the level of expectancy as a black person, the only black person huh. that I couldn't follow through. Mm. So, I mean, I mean, that scarred pretty, pretty hard. I mean, I didn't go home and cry about it. I didn't, you know, uh, you know, but, but it, it definitely scarred me in a way where um, it, my perception of myself, uh, the perception that I want to have of people, how people see me, um, I, that springboarded for me some of the things I still deal with to this day, where I'm an overachiever, where I will go above and beyond for people to recognize uh, my positive characteristics or uh, my skills or my education uh, or, um, you know, anything about me to say that 
I can do or be anything just as much as you are. Don't get it twisted because my skin is darker than yours that I can't excel in anything. And so, I mean, that has, man, um, really, from that point on, I mean, just to give you an idea, in high school, I was a captain of the football team. I didn't play basketball in high school. <laughs> Thank God. I didn't. No, I, left. I knew. I knew. And perhaps that was part of the scarring thing for me, where I was like, hey, I, I'm never going to touch a basketball uh, again. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, um, and some of these things I'm thinking back just now about. You know what I mean? So, yeah, like but, maybe. Maybe it would have yeah. been okay. Yeah, maybe it would have been all right. It. Maybe I got better. Maybe who yeah. knows? You know? Well, you would have if you practiced. Right. Well, practice. <laughs> Get outside the uh, the group of guys that I was playing with. Yeah. That's right. Good, you know. Um, but uh, you know, in high school, uh, you know, I, I captain of the football team, uh, you know, president uh, of of. Um, Call it thing. Um, student council, president of student council, uh, you know, a peer leader, uh, you know, I got rights, I had rights to the teacher's lounge, like, I was that, like, I was, <laughs> I, I was going totally above, and, yeah. above and beyond to make sure <laughs> I was liked and loved by every teacher and by the principal himself. I remember um, for events that we did in the school that the student council did, you know, um, the, the principal would write me checks and give me cash and just because he trusted me. And I, I love that. I, I used to love that, that this white middle-aged man trusted me enough to handle the funds of the school. Like that did something for me yeah. where I was perceived as an honest person, as an intelligent person, as a go-getter. Um, and it had nothing to do with the the, the color of my skin. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if I didn't have those events that happened to me, if I didn't deal with the many microaggressions, would, would I struggle so much today with making sure uh, that, uh, for instance, at a football game that my son attends, like I coached my son's team. This was uh, when he was three years old. Um, and I did it for a variety of reasons. Like one, obviously, um, you know, for my son to make friends. Uh, two, for me as a pastor to get, to get into the community. But three, there was a hidden agenda <laughs> that the predominantly white uh, other coaches, other players, and their parents saw me a black man as a decent man. And I would go above and beyond to smile, to make phone calls after a kid got hurt. Um, other stuff that coaches do, coaches do now, because they saw me do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a leader. But, but, but like, but I have to say, like, obviously, a lot of that was from the kindness of my, my heart. But a part of a part of the influence was to make sure that I was seen as someone who cared, not just as black men. Yeah. Um, and that has fueled a lot of stuff for me, in many ways positive, but in a lot of ways negative, um, uh, where energy that I exert is unnecessarily exerted because of that place in my heart where if I'm in a room full of uh, white people, I've even found myself, well, I will go above and beyond to smile big to make sure I shake everyone's hand, make sure everyone knows me, uh, make sure everyone knows what I do for a living, make sure people are comfortable with me to see that I'm not a threat. And this is subconsciously yeah. happening yeah. in my mind because part of me, I am wired. I am an extrovert, without a doubt. Yeah. I am an extrovert. But I've noticed in rooms where it's more diverse or where there's uh, more black people that I'm not as energized to do so. Yeah. That I'm a bit more relaxed in that aspect of my life where I don't feel like everyone has to 
know me or I have to smile big or everyone has to see uh, and know what I do for a living. So um, it's, it's and, and once again, this is my story. This is my experience. Mm-hmm. There are many other black people, African Americans, Americans throughout history whose experience is way worse. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. who have been physically harmed, who have been unable to purchase a car or purchase a home, who've been kicked out of place. Like, so that is not my experience. And who knows uh, if I did experience that, where I'd be today. But, yeah. um, but the experience that I had in Black America um, as a Black American, um, you know, has, has formed me, has shaped me in many ways that I still have to deal with and wrestle with. And one of the things that I think that hits me even harder is today with everything going on, I, I, like I said, in the 90s, I, I experienced mainly microaggression. You know, I was not really exposed, nor was anyone um, in particular where I lived to a lot of the atrocities that were happening to uh, you know, unarmed black men being beaten or, or killed or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, outside of Rodney King, I think that was the biggest, the biggest yeah. one that I, I grew up with. Um, but that's not to say that it wasn't happening yeah. all over the U.S. And mm-hmm. if you look and do research, it was. Uh, and, that, and that's just the ones that we know, right? There's many more that were undocumented or things that we don't know because it was never reported. Um, but so today, when I see the events that are happening, um, you know, for me, it's like I'm processing this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's somewhat new to me because, uh, you know, growing up, I didn't get a wind of, of a lot of that going on. If it didn't happen near you, you didn't know. There weren't, you know, right. cell phones with cameras on. There, none of that was happening. Um, so for me today, with a 13-year-old son who looks like he's 17, yeah. um, it brings up more challenge because I'm less concerned about me. I know how to deal with, uh, with, with aggressions, microaggressions. I know how to deal with even if um, I'm accused of, I, I know how to deal with that. I've, I've learned that through my resiliency yeah. to how, how to navigate that. Uh, but my son, who's 13, he's learning that. And he's learning it at a season where there's increased tension, yeah. um, right. where he's able to get wind of the information, to see what's happening out there, to see the murders, to see the atrocities, to see the injustices. And so it's, it's weird because for me, I'm in a different place. Um, well, I'm not in a different place, but I'm in a specific place where I'm processing as my son is processing. Yes. And then as we process together, we have to come up with a plan of action to process, to lament, to heal, and then to be resilient enough to say, hey, this can't stop you from living, but you have to live with a greater consciousness to know that because of your skin, this may happen to you. Yeah. That I didn't, I didn't have at 13. I had, yeah, maybe, you know, someone will have, say a joke or someone may assume something about you, but not to the point where, dude, you, you might get locked up, you might get shot at, you might get killed. Yeah. Um, that's the present reality. And I don't want to jump to that, to that end of it, but what I, when I see the atrocities that are happening to unarmed black men in my mind i don't go man i need to be safe out there because if that happens to me i need to know how to respond no because i I know how to respond yeah my mind immediately goes to seeing my 13 year old son yeah in that same situation and not know how to respond because he's only 13 yeah um and the, the scariness that, that comes with that. Um, and the conversations that I have with my son, you know, if you're approached by a police officer, make eye contact, keep your hands out of your pocket, make sure you address them 
you know, uh, appropriately and, and respectfully. And if there's any issue, you know, tell them to call us. You know, that's a constant conversation, a constant conversation. I mean, right now, um, you know, for a lot of people who are allowing their kids to ride their bikes, my son has to come home every hour and a half. Not a phone call. Yeah. You come home. I want to mm -hmm. see you. I want to hear, you know, what you've experienced out there. And, and, and it's out of, out of concern. It's out of caution. But it's also because we're, we understand the reality of what's going on out there. And so to also protect my son, but to educate him as well. These are some of the things that I have to do, that my wife has to do, that many other parents who are white don't have to do. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where this has become most impactful for me, is raising a, a, a young black man today. Um, because I, the reality is I could, I could deal with my past hurts. I could navigate um, those well. Um, and I see therapy for all of that. And, and you know, my self-talk has to be really good every day. Yeah. Uh, I have to lean into my identity as a follower of Jesus. I have, to, I have to live out of that. Because if I don't, if I don't, if I skip a day, um, it, it gets pretty out of control uh, yeah. quickly with how I see myself, how, how, how badly I desire to, um, to seek approval from people. Like it can, it can throw me right off. Um, but I can navigate it. But I think my bigger concern, obviously, for my son and my my other children as they grow up in this in this culture, in the context, in this climate, that one they're safe. Two, um, you know, one of the things that we have to constantly do with our children, um, and I'm sure every parent does to a degree, right? You want to instill confidence, yeah, in your children. But for my kids, being of darker skin tone. And like I mentioned before, um, that double consciousness, when that comes in, we have to fight against that heavily. Yeah. And so uh, con con continuously speaking positively into my children, and mm -hmm. continually speaking into areas that they're great, you know, mm -hmm. continually speaking to them about, you know, things where they feel negatively about themselves instilling why it's not negative, instilling why it's positive in, in some of their differences. And, you know, my daughter Rayana with her hair and struggling with that, and, you know, your hair is beautiful. Like, you don't know, you don't understand how beautiful your long, curly hair is. Like, people would die to have hair like that. Like, I have to I say, I love her hair, especially when it's, like, just not done. There's yeah. nothing better than that. Yeah. There's Oh, great. That's right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and just reminding her that that's beautiful. And it's but young girls, young, young black girls, they don't like their hair. That's right. Because that's, they think their right. hair has to look like that's right. something else. Because, because they want to be accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they want to be accepted. They, you know, to have your hair a certain style is, yeah. is a bit more um acceptable in the business world it's a bit more acceptable in your friend groups it's a bit more acceptable and so you you will do what you can i mean i think anybody will. anybody yeah, will true. everybody wants to be accepted you mm -hmm. you will make compromises to make sure that you you are accepted and and often you and and, and as a black person you will make so many compromises so you can almost forget about who you are yep um, you can almost begin to go the opposite way where you begin to hate who you are yeah, and have issues with people who look like you. And, and that's yeah. a big piece. Yeah. That's a big piece of what, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of people talk about the black on black. But that's yeah. a big piece of that. Yeah. You have to understand psychologically what's happening and yeah. what has happened mm -hmm. in those things, in those areas and in, in, in the lives of those young black people. Um, mm -hmm to fully say that, that, you know, that, that's not an argument. <laughs> you know, it's, it's I, part of it. Why don't I say one thing just to piggyback off of what you say, and then I definitely want to hear everything you have to say, because sure. I just, I can't 
I, I'm realizing it as you're talking because when I th when I talk to you, I don't see your skin color. Like it doesn't. I don't. It just doesn't happen for me. So it's weird. And when I so when I'm thinking about people, I'm just thinking about underneath. And what I what I talk about on this podcast a lot is core beliefs that like our core beliefs are fueling our thoughts that are just like generating over and over again. And then they're, they're impacting our feelings, our choices and our actions and everything. And I'm thinking like, you're describing this, like this fighting against this feeling of less than, right? Yeah, and like, when I talk to people, I feel like that's such like, so some people who feel less than like, that's a core belief. I'm less than everybody else i'm not good enough or i'm not smart enough whatever it is or i'm not light enough skinned it doesn't matter but it does matter because it's very systemic with you see i'm very cautious because i don't want to act like it's nothing because i'm not i'm i see it as real so now like what you're saying now i'm i'm thinking that i see people who feel less than doesn't matter in what way and they have different responses they can either become really like they they become they overcompensate yep. and then hate who they are like women yep. will do that like they'll they'll hate being a woman right or they'll overcompensate like being a people pleaser that's right. right and then if you think about sometimes people feel less than and then they act less than that's correct because 100%. then their shame just takes over and that's then right. You know, and then you see people like just, they end up being like, whatever, addicted to drugs. Yep. And then they, yep. they just continue to go down because they just believe right. this. So it's like, it's really exactly like this idea of mission awake. Like, like we have to wake up to no matter what that programming is, like the world you were born into, white, you know, being a, a, a minority in America, right? And then, or in your community, and then that impacts your core belief Absolutely. right and then all of our then like the behavior becomes instead of just like behavior that's meant to be it becomes like survival skills that's exactly like, it yeah that's exactly and i think it. it's so like now i am not comparing this at all because it's mm -hmm. not the same but i grew up in a really really like um kind of wealthy uh, white Jewish neighborhood on the water. And mm -hmm. my parents were hippies. They didn't cut the lawn. It was totally humiliating, like the way I lived, the way my house was. I would get dropped off like three blocks away when I was seven years old and pretend it was my house and walk home. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I always felt, I don't, and I, let me tell you something, Ray, I never talk about myself on this podcast, but I'm doing it. And basically the shame, the core, like yeah. the, what I wouldn't have friends over, like, and my parents were like brainiacs. They were genius. They were, yeah. but you know what? Let me tell you something. My mother wouldn't wear a bra. My mother was a hippie. She was a beautiful mm -hmm. woman, but Jesus, how embarrassing, you know, she would wear like a skull cap hat in a, those Volkswagen vans and like yes. pick up hitchhikers. And I would be in the back, they'd be freaking tickling me. I mean, like, wh oh, where, geez. where is the adult in this environment? But anyhow, so my point is, is that I always felt less than, yeah. and it made me like, I, I, I'm just relating to you because I feel like this is more of what we need to do. Like I'm relating to Ray, not as a separate divided person because he's black. I'm relating to underneath his heart that I'm a damn people pleaser. I just want everybody to like me. Yep. My whole life. It, you know what? And it actually works out pretty well. It got me pretty far. You oh, know? it'll take you places. <laughs> it it'll take you places. You know? Until, that, until you're by yourself. Exactly. And you're like, oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. I, Brian <laughs> said something hysterical. He goes, I, my anxiety would just be fine. I can't remember exactly how he said it. If just people could just call me every five minutes and tell me that they still like me, that they're not mad at me. Like everything would just be fine if you're just that's not right. mad. And I just want, I'm going to say a couple, just one more thing about you. Just Go for it. Funny. I, when you were talking and you said something, you said, when I'm in places like, you know, that are predominantly white, whatever, like I'm like the guy, I'm smiling and everything. And I'm laughing because I'm thinking, oh, that day he was at my house. I was thinking, what's wrong with Ray? He's in a bad mood. And then I got like really super happy and I'm like, 
oh, he feels comfortable with me. He doesn't have to totally. be. He doesn't have to do anything. Oh, and then I felt totally. so much better. I probably still, being the people pleaser, people pleaser, was still thinking about that day. So now it's yeah, cleared up. So but anyhow, totally. you know what I'm saying? So, and then I'm thinking, now, this is bad because I'm going to say it to you. I hope it's okay. We can always cut it out if you don't like it. But there sure. was this one time, I never forgot it. I actually brought it up as a joke because I thought it was actually crazy when you said it. And if you get mad at me, I'll take it out. But it was- Go for it. It was when I was at your house. My kids were really little, like Elijah, and they wanted to go get ices. Do you remember the story? I've uh, said I it because yeah. I think it's so damn funny, but yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I'm making a bad joke now, but for black people, I don't even know. I don't even right. think it was like any other color than me, but anyhow, like we're the same. So basically, they're like afraid. Right? Elijah's like, well, it's like 10 o'clock at night. I don't want to go out and walk and, and go. And it was like a it's a, it was a white neighborhood. It doesn't matter, yeah. but it was a white yeah, yeah. neighborhood. And he's like, I don't want to go. I'm scared. And, uh, and, uh, Ray, you looked at him. You go, are you kidding me, Elijah? I go, have you looked at me? I'm a black man. Everyone's afraid of me. We're going to be fine. <laughs> and I'm like, and I laughed so hard because I never even thought of that. It didn't even cross my mind, but it made me, I told that joke. Like, I feel bad that I'm telling it as a joke because it's not yeah. funny. It's right. not funny for you that you actually, and uh, that really, because um, I heard another man speaking about that, like this mm -hmm. man was on, uh, you know, on a video and he was saying like, do you know how hard it is for me knowing that you're afraid of me? And I just like, yeah. my, I, I wanted to cry. Like, and I never even thought about that for you because I don't think of you as different than me at sure. all. Like it doesn't even cross my mind. And I... I guess it's good, but in a way it's, I guess, not considering that right. to think that people, I mean, I've always been so afraid my whole life of anybody. I don't care if they're black, white, whoever, if it's dark and you're a man, you're a rapist as far as I'm concerned. So I don't right. care, whatever. Right. I don't care what right. color you are. I don't trust yeah. you. So basically to me, to feel powerful that other people would be afraid of me. I actually liked yeah. it. I was like, wow, that must yeah. be great. But right. from your well, end, it must feel horrible. Yeah, of course. I mean, definitely in certain situations where I know that um, because I'm present, something ain't gonna happen, right? And so there are occasions where that works in my benefit. I, I mean, I'm sorry, sense. Ray, that's so wrong on my end, but I'm yeah. like, wow, I love that. But that's sick that I love that idea. <laughs> well, coming from someone who's afraid a lot, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, it makes sense. Yeah, it totally for makes you, sense. it's horrible. And I oh, hope yeah. no one gets Listen, nobody get mad at me for saying, I'm just being honest. I'm being a real person. Yeah. No, All this right. is it. I mean, that's the reality. That's the reality. But like, even to go back to what you said before, originally, like how, how, how you feel, right? Your feelings uh, impact your behavior, mm -hmm. right? And how you feel about yourself impacts how you behave. And so if someone is feeling less than, um, you know, you may have certain reactions where people cut themselves or, or whatever, or whatever the damage is. And I don't really want to go into that so much because I don't know all of that. I'm not a therapist, but um, for Black people, once again, that double consciousness, and then taking a look at your history, and then seeing what's happened, especially if you live in an area and your parents or you grew up in a home where your parents are struggling with that, you know, the thing about it is that often these feelings, um, these behaviors are hereditary. And they just keep happening over and over and over again. And the cycle gets repeated over and over and over again. And then what you may happen, what may happen is someone who recognizes that and gets awaken is like hey i want to stop this process then you have things that exist that are against you that you can't stop the process where you deal with systemic racism where there are things that don't allow you to get the proper uh whatever it is maybe, whether it's education whether it's a loan whether whatever it is that you don't have access to do that yeah. Um, so not only do you not want to be in the process anymore, but a system is created 
that's against you. So you can't mm -hmm. get out of that system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, and that's what's even more uh, disheartening. That's even more what, and, and here's the thing, people that are not aware of those challenges won't, won't know, don't know about those challenges. So many people will make arguments to say, well, you've got affirmative action. You've got all these things that have been done uh, to make a way for the black man or the person of color in America. And, you know, the truth of the matter is until you're able to see the pain and witness the challenges firsthand of what most people, most black Americans, what they face, then, then most likely you will change your team. But if you don't know, you, you're not gonna change your team because you're living within a bubble that um, you're only seeing, uh, you're seeing what's happening from what you've encountered, right? Exactly. And so, and, but, and, and that is the definition of privilege. That's it, mm -hmm. right? You're only aware of the privileges of a system that is created to help you Right, and then when there are other people, you're like, "Come on, this system works. Look what it's doing. Look what it's done for me. Look what it's doing for my kids. Look what it did for my my parents before me." Um, and you're like, "Well, wait. You're not seeing how it affects other people. That same system yeah. does yeah. not work for other people the same way it's working for you. Um, and until you're able to see that and witness that firsthand from those stories, and and, and that's the thing, right? You're not going to know unless you know, unless there are people that you love, people that you care about that have been affected or are being affected by that until you come to a new level of being woke or awakened to the realities of the current system. So can um, I just, yeah. can I just say something? Cause I now, I, again, I'm like, I, again, I always hesitate talking about this any subject that I feel like, obviously there's always so many different points of view, but because I'm a therapist, I have a point of view just sure. as a therapist. So like, as people are looking at systemic um, social issues, like the external stuff happening, which is all real and valid, I'm always thinking about the inside. I can't help it. That's just how my brain works or what I'm, what I'm bent towards. So I'm thinking that just for, like, no matter what, and I feel like this is this whole podcast like I feel like my whole damn mission like I want to scream yeah. I want to scream from the freaking mountain type uh, tops to the world that it doesn't matter what system you're in like mm -hmm. if deep down inside you feel like crap yeah if you don't know that you that that's not actually true about you and your identity if you don't know yeah. that how even if people it doesn't matter i could hand you like it doesn't matter what color you are i could hand you the best job i could hand yeah. you the best wife husband sure. any privilege in the world but if you believe in your heart that you are not good enough for that yeah somehow yeah. some way you're not gonna do it and yeah. it's not good and it's not your fault this is like my thing like i want everybody to know it's like it now i'm I'm a person of faith. Don't get offended if you're not. But like, I feel like it's classic. When Jesus hung up on that cross, now this is like from my mission, my agenda. I feel like Jesus is speaking for me. All right. I know he's not. He's speaking to everybody. All right. So don't even, don't comment. Okay. <laughs> but basically when he hung up on that cross and he said, forgive them for they know not hmm. what they do. Now I think yeah. about every single one of us, like, like we don't even re like, it doesn't matter. Like, let's say somebody's like always in debt and then they like, yeah. they get like a, a ton of money or something. And then they find themselves back in debt again. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute. I don't understand. How did that happen? And right. I feel like it's like, and it's not your fault because you, it's just awareness. So mm -hmm. I feel like I, I, maybe this is a little like crazy on my end, but Ray, we could, we could, we could conquer this problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's just been forever on this that's earth that's it I know we that's can, it am i being grandiose okay yeah, a little just a oh, little yeah. bit all right, all right. i don't care I have, wait all right 
Okay, I am being grandiose. But if you don't think big, how are you going to get big? Right. Well, I'm thinking the hearts of the the heart like like the hearts of people is what they've been hurt through generations. And I'm going to say one more thing. I'm going to be quiet. The one other no, thing I want to okay. say is that I'm there's another thing that biologically that happens. You know, how it says in the Bible that to the third and fourth generation that. Mm -hmm the sins or the behaviors of the fathers follow people, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's been proven through epigenetics that that is actually happening with genetics. Mm. That if the decisions and the, the thoughts that I'm thinking today, and then those choices, those feelings, those experiences I'm having inside, I pass on literally to yeah. my children, which is so yeah. crazy, but it's biologically showing that one gene has 35,000 different choices, different mm. uh, ways that it can um, uh, convert. So like there's, there's hope. So even if like all the generations have been like oppressed and whatever, like if people just know that like working internally, there's a way to make a difference that. internally that will actually impact you know, even just the what, what you see in front of you, because when you believe that there's no opportunities for you, you there, then there isn't, you can't even see them. And, and then you have the system outside where people are also oppressing you at the yeah. same time. And you right. believe it. It's like, oh my God, you have to be a person like you had the opportunity in your family mm -hmm. where you, you had, you were growing up in a good family and you were also mm -hmm you you were able to push past the obstacles and see something different like a survival yeah. skill to be to be seen differently but if somebody Absolutely. doesn't have that yeah it's like yeah. a double double layer Absolutely. i hope i'm not saying anything offensive really no not at all i mean and that's you know a big part of what affects a lot of people within the african american community is hopelessness yes it's hopelessness it's no matter what i say or do nothing's going to change no yep. matter what i say or do i'm not going to be viewed differently we are not going to be viewed differently and so and and for a lot of people even with the violence and the protest now i believe there are people who are downright terrorists that just yeah. want to mess things up on purpose yeah. so that that becomes the louder voice than the peaceful protest but i will have to say that there are people who are just you know i would say even the younger people who are just angry yeah you know, once again, those yeah. beliefs yeah. affect yeah. those behaviors. So if you feel less than, or maybe you were even told less than, yeah. and you are in a system that uh, doesn't allow you to be more than, that is telling you that you're less than, and then yeah. you see these, these, you know, these deaths that almost prove, you know, the yeah. thoughts that you have about yourself, you know, you either have two options, either you just break down, or you explode, right? And yeah. and um, and that's what you're seeing from from a. I'm not saying everyone. I'm not saying even from a lot of people, but you're from a segment, a, a portion, that that's their response. Or I should say, not even response, but a reaction that they're having mm -hmm. to what's going on. Um, and then you got to, you know, there are people who are just tired of being locked up in COVID-19. That's what I you just want to just want to go out and just ah! mess some stuff up. You know <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? Exactly. Cause like, I it's not just, it anymore. that's right. It, it's not just black people. It's people of all colors, yeah. ethnicities, white people are, are running in and out of stores, right? People are angry cause they lost their jobs or I just want to get out, you know, whatever. And they're just jumping in on it. And it's unfortunate because that's not the story that's adding to the negative story the, and, the, and the truth of what is trying to be done. Um, kind of goes behind all that. But. Isn't it true though that like in any circumstance, I don't know, there's an opportunity for like good or not good. It's like, and it depends, like if you're, I feel like when you're broken and you're hurting, like there's, there's always like, like, I, I mean, a, evil to hand you something there to do, like whatever yep. it is, you know, here's, oh. here's a survival skill, here's a drug or here's a club to go hit somebody, or here's, you know, here's a way to feel better. There's always something there. And I just want to say like a neurological thing that I think is, um, again, when I say these things, I'm, to, I'm validating what's happening inside, but I'm also talking about there's a whole system of crap going on inside that 
most people aren't even aware of that yeah. neuro neurologically when you're wired a certain way like if you are wired to be less than or you're wired to believe that the only way really to survive in maybe um even the town you live in is through violence whatever it is whatever yeah. or or through people pleasing it doesn't matter but if that's wired in you our brains there's a part called the reticular activating system and that part of the brain will filter out anything that doesn't support what's already believed in there. Mm. So when mm. another choice is, is um, presented or even in the same room, you will, your, your filter, your mind will not, your brain will not allow it in. So then it's almost like that feeling like you're destined, like, cause you can't, and that's why, again, I always tell people, I repeat this over and over again, but by the time when we're born, we have 100 billion neurons. By the time we're, and we have 25 billion synaptic connections. By the time we're seven, we have a quadrillion synaptic connections. And what that, that's a thousand trillion synaptic connections. And what those connections are for are all the data that came in through our five senses and then the meaning that was attached to that data. So all the meaning attached to that data is, in, is already wired in somebody by the time they're seven. And because our brain in every environment has to reorient us and make sense of it and develop a conclusion. So there is a lot of conclusions that are drawn by the time we're seven that aren't even based in the actual reality. We just had to come up with a meaning. So once we have that meaning and that's like our worldview, that's what I believed about that scripture. Like do not be, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I feel like yeah. that we are so bound by that. And yeah. if, a, if a little child grows up from the time they're seven years old in a community where they're taught that they're less than because of their color or whatever, and that their families are less than and that they don't have any opportunity and that this is the way things are, how can they, when they see an opportunity in front of them, their, their brain is so forged to only now, even if everything in, and let's say in the room they're in, there's an opportunity over in their corner. They're not going to see it because right. they're not able to even see it. It's not anybody's fault. It's, it, well, society is, a, but, but right. you see what I'm saying? So it doesn't, yeah. and I feel like if people at least just know that, like that's what I want to get out there. Yes, we're talking about external things that need to change and I am all for it, believe me. But I feel like even like, our society, the way maybe white people are oppressing black people or negativity, that's all because of their bull crap wiring and what they learned and they don't see another way. Like if somebody believes that somebody of a different skin color is less than them, what, how, think about how they must have grown up or what yeah. they learned. Absolutely. But that's my rant. So, no, um, no, it's spot on. Um, yeah. So Ray, tell me, is there, I know that you, that we, I got to make sure I'm good to you. So maybe you'll come on again. I got to make sure I shut off quick and I'll keep talking. So Ray, tell me, what, <laughs> tell me, what do you, what would you want people to know? What do you, I mean, uh, we're going to fix this, right? Okay. Sorry. But we're going to fix it all. We're going to fix everybody. We are narcissists. And damn it, please, we're gonna, please, I please. know, you like us. I've been you like up all, we're doing it. <laughs> no, just, I think. Just follow Ray and I. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the we'll, hell you're gonna end up. But we'll you know do it what? to the death. <laughs> but honestly, everybody will like you, okay? That's, right. That's one thing that'll happen. I can promise you that. Right. Everyone right. will like you. We will make sure that you're liked. You will have a really <laughs> nervous stomach, but people right. will like you. That'll be on my tombstone. He was well liked. <laughs> he was well liked, but he was a tormented soul. Totally. Suffering totally. All day. All right. He, he didn't. He didn't like himself, but yeah. other people liked him. That's it. It's listen. You don't have to like yourself. Just make sure everybody else in the damn world around you does. That's right. That's all right. right. No, I now listen. Don't take that out of context, and then just I'm, like, not, I'm not. I don't mean I'm you. Not. I'm not talking about you. 
I'm talking about the people who are listening, just taking the clip and like putting it on Twitter, like listen to Al and she says, don't like yourself. Look at Ray <laughs> is actually freaking cleaning up. He's got to go. I am. I don't have to go. Say goodbye. I don't okay. have to go. I don't have to go. <laughs> My light just went out. But that's okay. I got good natural lighting. Look at this, Ray. Do you think I'm famous? Look at Oh, got. you got the, you got yeah. the special light. Yeah, man. I'm on, I'm on videos all the time. The I'm just Oprah to, light. I gotta, I gotta like hide the imperfection so people like me. Oh my gosh. So people right. like. Yeah, we gotta, this is, that's my thing. I'm like, all right, whatever. That's another topic. We're gonna talk about not worrying about what other people think. That, that does need to be another topic though. Oh but yeah. I'd love to be, I'd love to be Oh part yeah, of that. let's do it. Ray, come on with Ryan and I. We'll just yuck things up. I. That's it. It's like. I don't even know what the hell happens on there. It's weird. Sometimes I'm thinking like, <laughs> why are people even listening to us? Right. And Ryan will be like really quiet like this. And he'll just be like this voice of reason. I'll be like, it. it's really weird. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> Brings it back. <laughs> no, 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 that's so good. No, um, yeah, I think here's the thing, right? I think there's, there's the one value that I would love for everyone who's listening to see is you know, how much they're loved, you know, that's first and foremost, if you understand how much you are loved and who you are and that identity based upon that love that the creator of this world has for you, that uh, the one who can hold this world in the palm of his hand, uh, who knew you before you knew yourself, who knew the challenges that you would face, who you knew the gifts and the talents that you would have before you even took the breath. He loves you more than anything else in this world. And that is the foundation of your identity. And that to me is by far the greatest awakening that anyone could ever have. Um, because it's not based upon so much of your, your experiences. It's not so much based upon what you're told, but it's based upon what the creator has said to you and what you mean to the creator and when you experience that there is no other experience like that in the world and that will carry you through any any challenge uh, any up any down any change that is the foundation uh, by which i my desire is that everyone can experience um, at least people that come in contact with me uh, that i'm able to share that with so that's that's number one the second piece I think. Oh wait, you! I lost you. Uh, there we you often, go. Want, yeah, we're good. We often want to uh, do things big. We want to change everyone. We want to uh, handle the masses. What are you trying to say? All right. I'm, right. I'm right. just saying. I'm just I saying. I know. Okay. It's it's one relationship at a time. Um, I I I think if you are here and you're listening and you have friends of color. Uh, lean in to those relationships. Ask them how they feel during this season without trying to offer your opinion. Just listen. Yeah. Listen. You might learn something. I think listening is one of the greatest acts of love right now for people who are hurt uh, during this season. So I would lean in if you are a white person and you have people of color that are feeling some sort of way. Uh, about this don't just call them and be like oh yeah i can't wait to quarantine to be over if we can hang like how is what's going on today affecting you and then just listen just hear them out there would be so much that you could learn an area of their lives that maybe they've never been able to feel uh open to you about they may share and you will learn so much from that so that would be my first step for or my second step for people who who want to to uh, step into this. Uh, I think another thing is get off of Facebook. Uh, uh, it, it, will, it will mess you up right now. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, Absolutely. just get off of it. I would yep. say educate yourself the best way, reading books that deal with systemic racism, that mm -hmm. talk about uh, what reconciliation can look like. There's a cool book that I'm actually, actually asking a portion of our church to read called Anti-Racism because we are really going to talk about how we can be followers of Jesus and be anti I mean, Jesus was anti-racist. Yes. You know, he saw everybody as individuals and he didn't see the, 
He knew their differences. He went to the brokenness in the differences and he called wholeness and healing to all that. So I think being anti-racist has to be a part of how we are, how we respond as followers of Jesus. But even if you are not a follower of Jesus, it can educate you on a lot of the terminologies that people are talking about today. Uh, you know, um, what bias is, you know, uh, whether implicit or explicit, what is, what are the varying degrees of racism, uh, you know, all history of the African American, you know, all of that you, you can educate yourself today. And that will just open your eyes a little bit to the challenges that have gone all throughout the history, all throughout history that brings us to the challenges we see today. So, uh, communication with people of color, two, educating yourself. And then three, here's the other thing. If you don't have any people of color in your life, get some. Uh, straightforward, uh, get some. Uh, it's not okay to live within your bubble anymore. It's mm -hmm. just not. And you have to be uncomfortable. You have to make yourself uncomfortable that you only are in a certain circle. And I would say this, even to people of color, get outside your circle, get to hear uh, the stories, get to hear the challenges, get to hear the fears um, that other people have uh, based upon what is going on today. Begin to love people well that don't necessarily look like you. Um, I think that is so important if we're going to move forward in the right step, that people go outside of their comfort zone to educate themselves, to listen, to share, and to love. If we stay within our own bubble, and, and here's the thing, we're going to want to stay where we're at, right? Because it's uncomfortable. Like, no one wants to be uncomfortable. Um, but we have to remain here if we're going to do this. It's like, you know, what, what, every, what every family goes through. Every family goes through uncomfortable seasons, right? Or uncomfortable conversations. But if you stick with it, if you navigate it well, that's the only way that you can come to healing um, and overcoming is by by, by leaning in. And so I ask everyone who's listening, lean in. Don't just go with your own preconceived uh, notions of what's happening, or what you heard on CNN, or what you heard on Fox News, or even your political. Don't even allow politics to get involved into this. Yeah. Right? Yep. Like, you've got to be able to separate. I'm not saying don't, don't get involved in politics. I'm not yeah. saying don't have a political opinion. But yeah, when it comes it. to taking action steps with this, it's yeah. got to be a heart thing. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a heart thing. It's got to be what you can do immediately in the circle of trust that you have right now. It's got to be that. It's got to be done that way. So being able to separate your political agenda, your political ideas from your desire to want to understand, to want to learn, and want to love. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. If you don't want to learn, if you don't want to understand, and you don't want to love, good luck with the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm just saying that. I'm, just, I'm just saying straight up. True. Up. Follower of Jesus, you don't have an option not to do that. If you're not mm -hmm. a follower of Jesus, good luck with the rest of your life understanding that. Because if you don't truly understand what love is, you will never walk, you will never be truly awakened. Mm -hmm. you, you will try to please, you will try to uh, just navigate life in your own selfish way what you think will gratify you, and it might, but it will only last for a little bit of time until you find yourself spiraling out of control again. You've got to understand what true love is based upon how much God loves you and base your identity in that and base, upon, base that on how you love others. Because that's the only real, true, unconditional love that's mm -hmm. out there um, that will bring healing to this. And so... Before I have another sermon, I'm done. That's pretty much. <laughs> drop the mic. You need a mic drop button. Oh, oh yeah. What do I got here? Let's see. Uh, let me see what I got. That doesn't do it. <laughs> that was a fairy sound. It's like. <laughs> it was a. Was it good? I need a thump. I need a thump sound. I need a thump. I don't have it. What is this? Oh. Okay, so Ray, yes. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. I just feel like um, uh, everything you said, you know, um, just stands on its own, but also um, 
it just completely ties into this whole mission and it's really helping people when you're describing being able to know your value and know how much you're loved i feel like that that's basically it that's it but when we have those beliefs that are are um not in line with that that take people's ability to be able to see that they are they have value and that they're loved and that God created them for more than this. Like I always want to tell everybody, you're made for greatness. There's not one person Absolutely. on this earth that isn't made for greatness. And what I mean, I mean your form of greatness. I'm not talking about some, you know, you know, yeah. sorted form. I mean, like whatever greatness you were made for, just the fact that you're here and the waste of life that's happening because of just the devaluing of people because of the way they've been wired or taught. I'll end with this one thing, and I just find it so fascinating. People have heard me say it, it this, this man a long time ago, and I never know his name. I, pro I keep promising I'm gonna get his name, but I, I haven't, so just get off of it, but I will. So the man, um, a long, long time ago in the 19, early 1900s, he wrote this kind of rant it wasn't, it wasn't Christian. It wasn't prophetic. It wasn't anything like that was like, even like anything, even any other kind of spiritual thing. It was just his impression of what he thought things would be like later on in our, in our country or in our whatever. And he yeah. wrote this whole thing and everybody thought he was absolutely crazy. And then he, and then it, they all came true. And it wasn't like he was, um, uh, you know, predicting things. He just saw intellectually what he thought would happen. Yeah. And then um, he wrote something else later, later, later on in his years. And he said the the illiterate of the 21st century would not be people who could not read and write. It would be, oh no, did you leave? Oh no, Ray, come back. I'm here. Oh good. I'm here. He said the illiterate Thank God, don't go. The illiterate of the 21st century would not be people who could not read or write. It would be people who could not learn, unlearn, and learn again. And basically, I yeah. find that so, that's even like, it fits in line with our faith also, because it's like being conformed to things yep. that we weren't meant to be conformed to, learning. And I feel like my job is just to help you just see what you've learned. Just see it. Yeah. And then, because you were able to see, Ray, I see that the reason I act this, I have, I have adjusted is because I needed to because of the color of my skin. So I learned yeah. that. So now what you're doing is you see it. So when you see it, you're able to un unlearn it by yep. seeing it and then learn again. What can I create? What can I create out of who I've been made to be, to be what I'm supposed to be? That's because right. we are like made, like there is not any person anywhere. I don't care who you are and I don't care how bad you feel about yourself. I know you know you were made for more than this. And I'm gonna leave on that note that there is not anybody on here. I don't care where you are, who hears this. I don't care what you believe. We're talking a lot about having faith. I don't care. If you are listening, I just don't want you to hear that as separating you from what we're talking about. It doesn't. No, yeah. you, are, you are right here. You're, uh, our hearts are right next to you. We're all the same. So I just want to say to you, whoever, that we are, you are made for greatness. You are made for wherever you are, for more than what that is. And whatever is bringing you disharmony, um, anything that's bringing you division or, yeah. or um, feelings less than about yourself, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell you the absolute truth. It, it's actually not true. Mm -hmm. And we are believing so many things in our lives that are not true day in, day out, morning, noon, and night, even if we're aware of it, because I, I yeah. fall into it. It's basically, we have to be aware, awake, that's why this is mission awake, awake enough to know that that thought inside 
you know, I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough. Oh, my hair isn't pretty enough. My hair isn't flat enough. My hair is whatever. That is that actually true? And that's what I want you to ask yourself the question. Is it actually true? And you know what? You're gonna, it's gonna feel true. Mm -hmm. But I swear to you, if it causes disharmony, hate, or any feeling of less than, it's not true. So I'm just gonna end on that note. I wanna thank you so much, Ray Longwood, for being here. I just also wanna say if you guys you guys want to you guys want to hear more from Ray or anything, he's at the Experience Vineyard Church. He's on Facebook, Facebook Live, right? If you want to yes. say anything, how do they how do they find you? Yeah, they come uh, go to we have a Facebook page, the Experience uh, Vineyard Church uh, on Facebook. You can find us at 9 30 a.m. every Sunday where we will be uh, having services live until COVID ends, uh, then we'll be back to normal services. But for now, we're just doing everything virtually. So we'd love to have you there. Uh, feel free to email me, uh, ray at theexperiencebc.com if you have any questions or concerns about faith or anything that we discussed. Last thing I want to say is this, darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate can't drive out hate. Only love can do that. Live with passion, live with mission, live with intention under the grace and the will of God. Be the light. Reflect God's love. Okay, I have to say something. I know that would be the perfect place to end, but I do have to say something. That right there that Ray just said, I have to say it, Ray, I'm sorry. But Ray has been saying that at the end of every service for a very, very long time. And I believe that that was a forecast. I believe that, that he didn't just say that because of what's going on in the world right now. He says that every single Sunday, right? So that is his, his, his heart. You know what? And I love that. That is like the best quote ever in the world. And it's true. Can't yeah, absolutely. Okay. So absolutely. now uh, listen, remember you can, you can reach out to Ray because don't absolutely. forget he's a people pleaser. So he's going to answer you. <laughs> I will answer as much as I can. <laughs> I got it. You know what? This is Allison answers. And somebody, I have like creeps who try to like contact me and like, I won't answer sometimes. And some guy I'm saying it in public. Cause if you're listening, I think it's hysterical. He, he said, um, in my Instagram, he goes, apparently Allison doesn't answer. Oh, what? Apparently Allison doesn't answer. Right. Allison answers. Well, I guess she doesn't answer. Okay. We're ending. Oh, Oh shit, scary. All right, rim shot. <laughs> Yo, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, so we're going now, guys. I'm doing my outro. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope you have a beautiful, blessed day. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook anywhere you can. YouTube, check out our YouTube channel. Now you can see us face to face. Have a great day.